glory. Okay. What a time and season we're in, amen? Would you turn to John chapter 1? The Gospel of John. The battle's on. It continues. Amen? You know, positioning is everything in the Spirit. And, and, and in the spirit of positioning, it's not about how much you know, it's who you know. Amen? I mean, you can go learn everything. You can memorize this Bible inside and out and still mess up constantly. The focus of the Word of God is to bring testimony and so that you and I would be a thirst and hunger for His presence. Because everyone wants His presence whether you know it or not. It is His presence that's everything. In His presence is everything. So we seek His presence. That's why we worship. That's why we go after Him. Why? We want to cross over. We want to cross over into His presence, into His love, and into His arms. Every time we gather. That's why the Word says forsake not to gather. It gives us an opportunity because when someone else is weak, you get stronger coming together. Amen? And there's a special anointing in corporate worship. All things can happen. Nothing is impossible. And we are in such a time and season right, right now where we are hard-pressed all over. No matter what's going on, there's an attack. That war, that spiritual war that started when the Lord threw Lucifer out of the garden, out of his throne, everybody out of the pool, amen? That war has been going on ever since. It's not stopped. We are in warfare. And unless you know how to warfare, you will become a casualty. People are used by the devil and don't even know it. And they think that they're fine. But we know it. Because we know them by their fruit. See, but they can't see their own fruit. And in this, God is so good. So merciful. And he always waits for us all the time. He's always waiting for us to turn from the ways that are displeasing to him so we can go to the ways that please him. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 10, hallelujah, or in the gospel of John, sorry. Chapter 1 and verse 10. It says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. And verse 11, let's speak it. It says, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believed in his name. Now, the word believe means to follow. You can't say you're a believer and not follow, then you're a liar. It says in verse 13, Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, or of his Spirit. See, this is what changes everything, by being led by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. It says here in verse 14, And the word what? became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Now we know grace, God is the God of all grace. And there are areas of grace that we must understand. Grace does not give you the right to go sin. This lie of once saved, always saved. No way. Who you serve when you die is where you go. Never forget that. If you think that you just because you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and you're going to go out and play with the devil for the rest of your life and you're getting into heaven, you are wrong. Amen? It ain't going to happen. But in this grace, we know that there's multiple areas of grace. He is the God of all grace. That's what it says. Jesus came with the fullness of of grace 
and truth or of his truth. Because there are areas of grace that must be understood. I say that there's four levels of grace. And in this, we see that one of the things of God's grace is his unmerited love. It's his unmerited love. And I believe by the Spirit of God, and this is the difference. Because the Word of God was written by the Spirit of God, and without the Spirit of God, you're not going to interpret it. Either that or you become intellectually. Intellectual interpretation is not by the Spirit. That's why the letter kills and the Spirit gives life. How many of y'all know that they couldn't write enough stuff in this Bible about Jesus? They can't. <laughs> but there's enough in here to know him and to bring you to him. And there's enough in here to win every battle. But there's areas to where God wants to bring me and you deeper. Paul had deep revelation. Paul didn't have a Bible. He was Saul and Paul. He had a relationship. He had a visitation from the Lord. God slammed him, filled him. And Paul had to learn suffering so he could grow. So in this, we see that God's unmerited love for me and you is a part of his grace. Amen? You don't earn his love. You earn his trust. In his grace, it's called the plan of escape. In his grace is a plan. It's the plan to what? Escape. Escape the depths and deceptions of evil and escape the wrath of God. That's grace. That he came in the fullness of grace. He came in the, of a plan of escape. He came with the fullness in the area of his unmerited love. And he came with favor. Now again, favor is earned. But that's a part of his grace. There's another part of grace that's not talked about so much. And that's that time in between revelation. And it runs parallel with faith. And in this grace, in other words, he holds back things and hope that you will turn. See, in revelation, every time there's revelation for me and you, the restraints get stronger. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So I... In this four levels of grace, we must understand these things, grab hold of these things, and walk in these things, knowing that God is faithful to complete what he started, knowing that all things are going to work to the good. But in between, there is a grace, there is a period where he holds back his wrath or his judgment in hope that you will turn. Does everybody understand that? He gives everybody an opportunity. I mean, every one of us in here should be dead. Every one of us has had multiple opportunities. In fact, we weren't born righteous. That's why we were called little devils when we were kids, right? You little devil. We were born again in his righteousness, not our own. Amen? First Peter chapter 5. God of all grace. Oh, happy days. You know, Jesus came not only to bring the fullness of grace and of, of his truth, but he also came to bring us a sword, and it's called the sword of the Spirit. Amen? So that you and I could fight. He gave us weapons. Glory. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He says what? Be what? Sober, which is alert. Be vigilant, which is consistent. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may what? Devour. This is a warning. Be alert. Be consistent. Amen? It says resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Everybody goes through it. You know what the suffering is? Being torn away from the world. That terror is constant. Things that we're, we have picked up, they have to be torn away. Things of your past, there's a separation between the old and the new. Sometimes those things are painful because you're going to lose friends. 
you're going to lose things. But those things are really not a loss. You are to gain. From everything you lost, God always has a gain. It says resist them because everybody's experienced it. In verse 10, he says, And may the God of all grace, say all grace. That's what we just talked about, four levels of grace. All grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have what? Suffered. After you've been tried, after you've been tested, after you've gone through things. Why? Because that process, it is a process of tearing away. It is a process that you and I go through. It's a process of converting the soul. It's a process of allowing the new man to take control of the divine nature over the human nature. It is a process that we go through. But he says without cooperation through this process, there won't be a perfection. So he says during this process... After you have suffered a while, that's the process of conversion. What's going to happen? He's going to perfect. He's going to establish. He's going to strengthen. And he's going to settle you. So you're not, you will no longer be pushed out of position. You will no longer be misled. You will no longer make emotional decisions. You'll make decisions by him. Things are steadfast and stand strong in the Lord. So we see that there is a, Perfect, strengthen, established, strengthen, and settle. Again, suffering is the process of the tear away from the world's influence of lust, pride, and fear, selfishness, and the deception that goes on. So we are all in that process. When you come into the kingdom, welcome to the process. Amen. It's Holy Ghost Boot Camp. Officers Training School. Remember, there's a war going on. Je Jesus didn't come to bring fufu. He's not religious. He's the commander of the army. He is the Lord of hosts. This is not a religious operation. He came to destroy religion so he can arm his people and rescue souls that have been taken by false religion. Amen? In Hebrews 13. Glory. Hebrews 13. And the Bible says that the anointing teaches us. The anointing does what? Teaches us. That's the eternal presence, power, and truth of God Almighty. He is a person. The anointing is Jesus, the anointed one. It is anointing. It is his presence. It's his spirit. It teaches us. The Holy Spirit guides us to all truth. He tells us things to come. Without being filled in relationship, you're not going to know. You won't be able to interpret this word. People will walk around. They can memorize this whole Bible, I'm telling you. But there is more. He wants to bring us deeper. Into a deeper relationship. Into a place where there's such freedom and a knowing that you know who you are and you maintain your identity. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Let's speak it. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Is anybody there? Praise God. Let's speak it again. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly what? Say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of, the God, of God to you, whose faith follow considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's not changed. It's man's change. It's man's doctrines that changes Jesus' doctrines. Do not be carried away about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart is established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by a high priest for sin are burnt outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the camp. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. Again in this we are established in the truth of the doctrine of Christ Jesus by the Spirit, not intellectually. 
This is a heart-to-heart relationship. This is a spirit-spirit relationship. It is the spirit who brings things to remembrance. Amen? That's why when you pray in the spirit, you're praying in tongues, you're praying the perfect will of God. The Holy Spirit's releasing mysteries in your spirit. You don't know about them yet because the devil knows what you think. And when the Holy Spirit quickens you, they come to remembrance so that you can act warfare or whatever strategy is imparted in you. Again, but this is a place of relationship, not religion. This is where grace is abounding much. Come on into my grace. Come on into my fellowship. Come on in. I've got a plan for you. Much greater than the enemy's plan. Amen? <laughs> this must be understood. It is his life, not ours. This is the new life. It is insulated by faith. And that maintains your connection that runs parallel with grace. This understanding allows the blood of covering for covering of our sins. It allows his righteousness to cover our unrighteousness and allows his perfection to cover our imperfections. We are perfect in him, not in us. Amen. Again, in this area where there is that distance between revelation and in that time, it's a measurement of faith. In that, there's a parallel of grace that runs with it. See, people's faith can fail, but grace continues. Amen? But he's the God of all grace. We are established in the faith in him. In Romans 1, verse 8. Glory. Romans 1, verse 8. Let's speak it. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. That's pretty big. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Making request, if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift. So that you may be what? Established. Established. Everyone say established. This spiritual gift. What is a spiritual gift? Holy Spirit. That you may be established or that you may be known. See, what separates us from the world is the spirit of the living God. <laughs> it is the spirit of God. It's not about your intellectual. There's a lot of intellects. There's a lot of wisdom out there. But there's a wisdom that's from above and there's a wisdom that's from beneath. The world wants to keep people in captivity, never releasing them from this reality. But we know that there's two realities. This is a temporary one, but there's an eternal reality that we live. So we live from the future to the present, not from the present to the past. Amen? He says that, again, verse 11, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts so that you may be established, known. That is that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. Let's go a little bit further. I am a debtor both of, to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Again, the spiritual gift was the impartation of the Holy Spirit so that we would be known. Why? Because it's not, without the Spirit, you can't express Christ. You can talk about him intellectually, but you can't express him. That character will not maintain. It always falls. It always fumbles. Amen? It goes back to the old man. So that we would be known as children of the Most High, as an expression of his grace and the character of his 
unconditional love that you and I carry. We are carriers of his presence. We are carriers of his love. We are carriers of his power. We are carriers of the anointing. Amen? Let's go there for one second. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter two. To be established is to be known. It separates us. First John chapter two. And verse eighteen. It says, little children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they wouldn't have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know what? You know all things. That means the Holy Spirit holds all things. Everything is available to you. We have access to multiple things. Amen? Go to verse 27. It says, But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. So the anointing will teach you. If you truly have a relationship with him, you'll be taught by him. I didn't go to school to learn the things. I, you know what school I went? It's called closet. I went to closet school. And in that closet is where I had revelation and visitation and many things from God. This is where interpretation comes by the Spirit of God. See, we can learn from other people's experiences. I'll never forget one day there was a book there. I found it. And the Lord said to me, I want you to read it. I said, why do you want me to read this? I said, I, I'm, I'm, I, I was told just to read the Bible. He said, guy, this person spent 40 years of experience with me, and you can learn it in two hours. I said, cool. I'll read it. You got any others? Again, the Holy Spirit will teach you. This is when I realized that he was my mentor. I was mentored by the Holy Spirit, and he wants to mentor his children. This is not about a religious relationship. Look, if there are things you cannot learn. I mean, there's things you can learn. Amen? But there are things that you cannot learn that you must experience. That's how you learn. In fact, some of your sufferings, your trials, and everything else, you're going to learn from them. And God is going to test your faith to see if it's genuine or not. To see if you're genuine. He's going to check you here. But his first place he checks you is here. <laughs> he wants to know if your heart's right. If you're truly a man or woman after God. Amen. And Psalm 118. Grace. Psalm 118. Is everybody there? Verse 5. Hallelujah. So we see through the suffering, he's going to perfect. Amen. He's going to establish. You know, and in perfection, there's an area where we call it complete. In verse 5, let's speak it. I called on the Lord in distress. Anybody ever been in distress? Don't raise your hand. And the Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. 
Therefore I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surround me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. That's faith. That's parallel with grace. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They quenched like fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. You pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my what? Strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Again, he said that he would strengthen us. You know what a great way of being strengthened? You're strengthened when he reveals himself. You're strengthened when he answers prayer. You're strengthened in dreams and visions of visitations. You are strengthened with what we call by revelation. Revelation will strengthen you. Why? Because it encourages in you. Man, if everybody had a visitation from the Lord this morning, I think you'd be quite encouraged. I think you'd be quite strengthened. But this is where you and I are to chase after him. Amen? We're to be chasers of his presence. We're to be lovers of his presence. It is His presence that is everything. You are strengthened by revelation. Does everybody understand that? Everybody gets strengthened by revelation. And it's revelation of Him in His presence. Amen? In Proverbs 29. Again, when God responds to your request, it will bring strength. Proverbs 29. Are you waiting on something from God? Is it coming? Depends whether you hold on or not. Amen? Then it's coming. Well, that Mercedes you've been praying for, that might not come. <laughs> but you never know. <laughs> Again, we are strengthened by his response to us. Amen? Amen? And, of course, the revelation of his grace, which is his plan. In Proverbs 29, 18. 29, 18. Let's speak it. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraints. Restraints of what? The flesh. Because they become weary and weak. But happy is he who keeps the law. Revelation strengthens me and you. It strengthens our restraints of the flesh. It separates us further from the old man to the new man. Ephesians 6. When you are stronger, you are able to endure better. Amen. You don't go worse first. Hello? When you're strong in the Lord, you don't go worse first. And not saying that it's not going to approach you. But you're able to grab it by its throat. So you don't react. You wait to respond. Amen. <laughs> you grab react by the throat until respond comes. Ephesians 6.10. Let's speak it. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or trickery of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the, in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Again, we are to be strong. When it says strong in the Lord, it means strong in the spirit. Because the Spirit is the Lord. And the anointing by faith 
in grace. Why? Because grace is a part of his plan. It's all a part of his plan. In Psalm 16. Is everybody okay? Praise God. Simple teaching today. Everybody there? Verse 7. I will what? Bless the Lord who has given me counsel. So when you get counsel from the Spirit of God, he's called the Spirit of Counsel. Is that a response from God? Amen. Does it bring you strength? Yes. Now that depends whether the counsel, if a person's willing to receive the counsel, reject it. See, some people don't like to receive counsel. They get offended because they're too full of pride. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night season. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be what? Moved. That's settled. When you're settled, you can't be moved. That's where God wants us to be. But see, you, the enemy tries to move you here. Amen. But the first thing before he even moves you here is emotional. He always tries to move you emotionally, no matter what. That's why so many people fall, because they make emotional decisions which brings chaos. Amen? We must be strong in the Lord. Why? We want to hear what God is saying. We want to wait for his command. What are you telling me to do on this, Lord? You know, because we can go out, and I've seen many people go out, because the word says so. They're out on the streets doing all kinds of stuff. But even Jesus rebuked them. He said, money will come to me saying, Lord, Lord, I did this, I did this, I cast out devils, I laid hands on the sick, I fed, I did everything according to your word. And Jesus said, I don't know you. I never sent you to do those things. Because you practice lawlessness. You still got one foot in the world and one foot with me. You are serving two masters. I do not know you. Depart from me. Hello? Then he talks about the, the two, the Sets of virgins. Amen. Those who were foolish did not stay filled with the Spirit. And those who were wise stayed filled with the Spirit. Why? Because they're seekers of His presence. In His presence is His Word, is His truth, is His character, is the person. Again, you can get a Sports Illustrated book. You know, and you can read all the statistics. Man, you can know a person through a book, but never meet them. That's the difference between being in the Spirit or not. Being filled with the Spirit. Why? You're looking for the person now. You're not seeking the letter. You're looking for the person. And when the person speaks to you, he confirms with his letter. Or he takes you off somewhere. In other words, you can't find what color car to buy in here. Hello? Now, you can find out what person you should marry by character, but you'll know them by their fruit. So if you wait long enough, you'll know the manifestation. Amen? But many marriages are messed up because they should have never married that person. It was a lust affair, not a love affair. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be moved. You cannot set the Lord before you in the flesh. You set him before you in the spirit. Why? Because you have eyes to see him now. You have ears to hear what he's saying. He's always before you. He's telling you what to do. He's establishing all of his grace in us. His plan. His love. He's settling us. He's strengthening us. So we don't get moved out of position. You know how many people have been moved out of position? Look at what the enemy's done in this whole world. It's amazing to me how many people are masked. I'm still baffled. That they're still believe it. That's, that's the whole thing. They still believe it. I, I, I'm just baffled. I go in stores and whatever, 99.9% .9 of the people have a mask on. They're out there jogging with a mask on. Are you sick? You're going to be sick. I want to go up to them and tell them, Jesus, your Savior? Yes. 
well, why don't you believe them? You know, it's not a law. <laughs> this is not a law. People can take their masks off. That's why Jesus told our governor, take the mask off. Amen? It's not a law. But it's amazing people are under the law, not under grace. <laughs> They go back to the law. They started off in the spirit. Now they went back under the law. They started off in the spirit. They went back to the letter. Again, the letter kills the spirit, brings life. But only if the letter is backed by the spirit can it bring life. That's why it's called the sword of the spirit, not the sword of the letter. Everybody okay? Hallelujah. So the counsel is his response to strengthen and it brings strength in his presence and, and power to hold and to be settled in the grace. Listen, we need enduring power, amen? <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 2. Again, Jesus came so that we can be settled in his grace, unconditional love, plan of escape, and grant favor. How many know God wants to favor you? But there are things that separate us from his favor. He, things that we, people that do, think when sometimes they do things, he has to back off because he can't trust them. Again, if you're not consistent and alert, can he trust you? If you're not faithful, can he trust you? Can any employer trust anyone that's not faithful? No. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Is everybody there? Praise God. In verse 9. Let's speak it. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who what? Who love him. Now he says, if you love me, you will what? Obey me. But God has revealed them to us through his what? Through his what? His spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Depends how deep you want to go. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except for the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know all the things that have been freely given to us by God. Now how are we going to know those things? By the spirit. You're going to know all the levels of grace by the spirit of God. And you'll be able to experience all of these levels of grace. Verse 13. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural mind does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. The natural mind, the carnal mind cannot comprehend these things. It will try and interpret it intellectually. But it cannot be truly interpreted by the Spirit unless the Spirit is interpreting it. The carnal mind, your old man, is going to resist everything. That old man that's still in you. Amen? He's called the flesh now. He's to be crucified as you and I are led by the Spirit. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him. Nor can he know them because they are what? Spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For whom, has, for whom have known, who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ. Jesus came in the fullness of grace and truth. But the religious carnal mind can't go beyond the letter. Only by the Spirit. In this place where you and I walk in the Spirit, there is no withdrawing anymore. There's no withdrawing from Him. There's no relinquishing. And there's no looking back. 
we have reached the point of no return. It's over with. No more of the world. Amen? So he's going to bring us through that process of suffering. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Is everybody okay? Everyone say, I love suffering. All right, praise God. Why? So we can grow. Remember, suffering is nothing but a challenge. Everybody always thinks, I, I, man, when somebody says to me, oh, I guess God is causing me to suffer because I'm sick. No, it ain't God. God doesn't bring suffering on you to, to, for you to grow with sickness. Hello? We have enough challenges besides being sick. <laughs> Amen? Your experience, listen, we learn obedience through suffering. Amen? Things that we learn where to put. Every one of us has been challenged. And you will constantly be challenged. Better challenged by God than the enemy. But the enemy will try to challenge you. And he's going to bring you to a place so you stop enduring. Does everybody understand that? Again, here is God of all grace. Unmerited love, his plan, his favor. In the place where it's in between revelation. So he holds back things. Because he loves us unconditionally. Amen. Every one of us. Will fall and go through the process. To be strengthened. To be settled. Amen. We're going to go through this process. So that we get into a place and position. So that the mind of Christ is now take, taken over. The divine nature is now taken over. And you and I can't be moved. We will be challenged, but not moved. Why? Because we understand the way of grace. It's not some foolish doctrine that allows sin. God is full of grace. And his mercy endures forever. Amen? Now, his mercy means when you call out on him, Lord, have mercy on me. What you're asking him to do is consider you. Lord, have mercy on me. Consider me. What does he do then? When he considers you, he releases grace. Somehow, he rescues us and puts us in a place, in a position, so we can get filled with the Spirit and be led by his Spirit. And the anointing can teach us. Not carnality, not intellectually, but by the Spirit of God. So we can be an extension of his offspring of the anointing. Everybody got it? Everybody cool? Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. And we ask that your grace continue to abound abundantly to us, Lord. And give us the revelations as we go from one revelation to another. For you encourage us every time you reveal to us yourself, your plan, your love, and your presence. I pray for each and every one today, Lord, that they continue to grow and be strengthened in your grace and in the anointing. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.